Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Arts and Tech webinar series by Phil Arts. Uh, happy to welcome you here. Uh, the past week has brought us significant news that, in our opinion, will shape uh, technology developments this year and beyond. For instance, uh, Crypto Exchange Binance announced the start of uh, cooperation with the French NFT startup accelerator called uh, Station F. So they invested 100 million euro in the accelerator radiates. Uh, this in particular speaks to the understanding by mega companies as Binance uh, in the digital asset market of the importance of, of building an ecosystem of supporting the infrastructure startup, all that leads behind of NFTs. Also, the London-based metaverse startup uh, called uh, Improbable, they raised uh, one uh, 150 million round, 150 million dollar round. So uh, among the top investors, we could see familiar names like uh, top VC funds, uh, Anderson Horowitz and the SoftBank Vision. Uh, it's interesting that uh, for the UK as a country of incorporation of Improbable, this is the largest investment in the art and tech startup. So getting back to our uh, art, tech and NFT startup report, I believe you all have downloaded it uh, from our website and using it for your success. So according to our report, uh, in the UK, there are 46 arts and tech uh, startups um, in uh, the beginning of 2022, so which is the third place in the world after the US and China, uh, of which 25 are representing physical art market, means the startups which dealing with, uh, um, let's say, actions, um, management of um, physical art and 21 are digital and nft startups dealing with the digital assets so in this regard we have decided to invite a representative of the <laughs> london startup market to participate in our today's webinar i'm happy to welcome uh stacy mccormick a u.s born but yes. uh, uk based artist uh she is uh, the director and founder of an artist lab unit one gallery and workshop uh, which is supported by arts council of uh, england um, unit one gallery and workshop provides exceptional opportunities for artists and the public uh, since 2015 stacy organized more than 40 exhibitions with over with nearly 200 artists and creators uh, so and uh, establishing a growing community of over 300 artists today um, but stacy is also the visionary and the founder behind the <laughs> new art world app a startup called fair art fair hello stacy hi Thanks for joining us thank you for letting me be here and i'm happy to to present our uh regular co-host uh, the project manager of fuel arts sonia stubblebein who was also responsible for the content and research of uh, our annual report. Well, Stacey, we're so happy to have you here and we're very looking forward to having this online conversation and talk about art tech and about physical art markets and talk about obviously fair art fair. So probably it would be very logical to ask you, first of all, how you got into art and how you got into creating art because you're an artist by yourself. It's, it's a funny question because I've actually not really thought about that, but um, in thinking about it, I suddenly thought I don't remember not ever making art and it reminded me growing up in San Francisco, the exciting day when I was 10 years old and I won the San Francisco art contest as a painter. <laughs> so it's a very long career um, and I've always really woken up every day with that desire to make work and it's, I think it, with not doing it, it's not living. I think it's everybody that, and i'm a process painter really i'm in love with making art so i think that's it's impossible to say when it started it's always been there um 
So that's really, and funnily enough, that sort of growing up in California in San Francisco Bay Area, and then to find myself in the UK making a startup, it's a bit of a reversal of fortunes in a funny way. Uh, Stacy, I mean, I remember myself uh, while being founding my my first art tech startup, and I mean, uh, I've also was the manager, a functioner in the art world, in the art market. That helped me a lot because I, I had an art background. You also have an art background being an artist. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did you come up with the idea to start Unit 1? Can so you explain I, the concept of, of it a little bit? So let's let's speak about the, let's say, the, the project which leads beneath the fair art fair. Absolutely. So. I think from very, very early on, even when I did my undergraduate, I really sort of questioned the art market as we know it. And and I'm really the typical artist, did an undergraduate, did a master's degree, you come out of a master's degree and you're set adrift. You don't really have an inbuilt network. You have a lot of friends that are artists. The art world, as you know, it is this kind of voiceless, faceless place and you're supposed to find a way to win the lottery to get into a gallery and you kind of wait. And I always thought that was very, very strange. I had to have several jobs in order to afford the lifestyle I think I deserved beyond having a studio and being an artist. And um, so I had constantly had to exploit my creativity to do other things than paint because my painting practice couldn't keep me paying the rent. Um, and that puzzled me because we pay for expensive educations, et cetera, et cetera. So when I had the opportunity with this space here in London, I made a, I think a pretty radical decision and that was to make it a nonprofit um, and try to build a brand and a, and a community that could support itself without exploiting artists for profit. Um, and that was really in, in the bricks and mortar um, and it's been the dream from always here, but it's also with the rent in London and the cost of everything in London, it was foolish in many ways because it sort of meant that we had to support it philanthropically. We had to get funding. We had to get outside things. We had to do all kinds of crazy rent it for bar mitzvahs and you name it. Um, and, and, and it worked, really. It worked. It meant that the programming here could be completely free from the commercial drive. Um, and up until COVID, we really were balancing the books on, on doing that. We had great external renters that would not conflict with the programming. Um, and then we had this way of connecting the public to artists that was kind of unprecedented in this very friendly, approachable, the artists are working here, they're practicing here, and they're exhibiting here. Um, and the public really loved, and still really love this friendly approachability that we're now renowned for. And so what we discovered, it, it, it's really missing maybe in the art world, and certainly not in the nonprofit world, but certainly in the commercial art world, is this ability for the public to connect directly to artists and get to know them beyond the object they might buy. Um, and that that has just proven so fruitful um, and, and so rewarding that we wanted to find a way, one, to expand on it, but I also wanted a business model that would start to enrich us, you know, beyond the kind of scrapping together funding I just thought, gosh, there's got to be a way to enrich this entire thing and and create a revenue stream that would allow us to do more residents, more connections, more in real life, and take it outside the city centers. So the digital world became the obvious choice. Thank you. Yeah, we just so what is your, your path from running like Unit London Gallery to actually finding like fair fair, uh, fair, fair that you're doing today? So I guess about four years into running here, um, you might remember when Dot .art started, you know, when the, the, the launch of the Dot .art um, domain started. Uh, 2017. I guess yeah. So when that launched, I was looking at it and, and I just thought, wow, fairartfair.art .art would be so cool because it's this repeating decimal, you know, like the 333.3. And, and I thought, gosh, fair art, fair art, fair. It just gets more and more fair all the time. And so I just thought, I wonder if anyone owns that. And no one did. So that was the first step in the direction of fair art, fair's development. And it sat on the shelf 
and I was constantly sketching and dreaming and I had a, I have a whole sort of sketchbook dedicated to what it could be, but what it, I think in the very early days, I thought of it being a art fair that was only direct buying from artists and that model has been explored. Um, and then COVID hit and we lost our external income here. And I also didn't have any exhibitions or artists here and I had a whole lot of time and I had this um, Arts Council funding and I needed this thing, this business model that we could um, get money for to take us beyond COVID, which is what the Arts Council funding instructed we had to do, that this, we had a big grant to stay alive. And then there was a percentage of that grant that they said, we'll dedicate to a new business model that will help you expand and grow beyond COVID. And I went, now I know what I'm going to do. I started re researching the cost of startup apps and really looked at what we were providing for our community here and how it would translate into the digital world. Um, and that's really the birth of, of Fair Art Fair. You know, uh, I have a follow-up question before I ask, uh, let's say, uh, what I supposed to, to ask you. Uh, you've mentioned two cities. You've mentioned San Francisco, uh, where you started your uh, career, and you've mentioned London, where, where, where where you are based now. Um, mm -hmm. I remember one of the previous webinars with uh, Christina Steinbrecher Fund, the, the founder of uh, blockchain.art. She was brave enough to start to found her startup in the Bay Area in San Francisco, because uh, from the first perspective, San Francisco is very friendly to startups because it's Stanford and the Silicon Valley there. Right. But from the other hand, uh, the most of the startups, 99.9% .9 of the startups represent the fintech society. So it's quite yeah. hard to find the right place and the right investors and to focus their attention towards art and tech startups. So we heard about the peculiarities of uh, founding an art tech startup in the Bay Area. So my extra question is, uh, I mean, would be regarding the London art tech scene. So uh, was it hard to uh, establish a startup in the center of the art world <laughs> London, uh, I think... for, for centuries? Or maybe you, you'll tell us some peculiarities of uh, founding a startup uh, based in London. Well, I think I'm, I'm lucky in the fact that I started a maverick gallery in the heart of the art world. And I kind of work against the grain. I don't work against the art market as we know it, but. I started something that is an entirely different model and experiment. And so I think I'm unafraid to experiment, which I think helped to make a startup app in the art world. Um, I think London, London is firstly incredibly civilized and polite. So they'll never tell you if they hate what you're doing. Uh, whereas I think an American might say, you're an idiot, you can't do that. So I think at least the polite reception is always there. Um, but I, I think, it, there is a resistance in that I think what we're, we're, we do come up against is probably being misunderstood. And you really do have traditional art market here where artists think the only route to success is through representation. They have abdicated agency to the gallery metrics, um, unsurprisingly, because we have these superstar stories and these giant incomes. Um, but it is quite a lottery system. And if you look at the 55,000 registered artists in the UK, and between 1,500 and 2,000 galleries, you don't have to be a mathematician to know the odds are stacked against you in, in many ways. So I think what we're, our big responsibility at this stage is to recognize that the, the kind of exclusive elite gallery system is fascinating and exciting and brings amazing art to us for free, but it makes thousands of artists invisible and thousands of works of art invisible to buyers and so it's it's just really a huge and interesting opportunity, um, and and I think as soon as people understand that we're just we're really interested in creating a community of opportunity, and and it it's not a competitive space, that then that kind of reception of our technology is there. But I do think it's an old fashioned, not very digital, um, inclusive uh, world yet. I think the jump to it is is yet to be seen. So uh, let's <clears throat> let's have a mo more close look uh, at your startup at Fair Art Fair. 
So could you please present it and tell us and our uh, audience what is pioneering about Fear Art Fear? Yeah, so I sort of prefaced a bit there. So maybe that was an accidental intro. Um, so the problem that we recognize both through the gallery here in, in, in real life and, and now through the app because it's a, it's a working app with already a built community. But what we really recognized is accessibility. So you have these enormous numbers of artists and art lovers that are kind of blocked from finding each other. New York Times called it the Tinder of the art world that we're really creating this opportunity for them to meet. Um, and so it's, you know, we know it, the story is not new that the art market is dominated by the game, the gatekeepers. And I often, I compare it to the fashion industry, the top of the fashion industry, those dresses, those haute couture pieces are collected by a unique sector of very wealthy people and they should be. And then you have the fashion industry all the way to Primark with entry points for every type of consumer. And the deconstruction of the art world just has never happened. You know, you have the very top and then you have very little in between and very little accessibility. So what we see the solution is, is just to create that accessibility. And it, you know, you also have the city centric, you have all kinds of things that, you know, if you, you think of Northern England and how you might go into a gallery and find work, they're fewer and fewer. And there are a lot of artists that don't have the opportunity to get exhibited. So it's really crucially about accessibility um, and, and just having a platform where that community can get together, find each other, buy and sell. It's very simple. Um, we also took the brave decision to make it a non-transactional zero commission space, which is in the ethos of fairness. Um, we felt, you know, that if, if money is corrupt, then let's just not transact it. Let's just make this an, an environment of opportunity and connection. And then we support all that to happen. Um, so for instance, you're an art lover, you uh, get a subscription, you get amazing tools to catalog your collection, you get all this backup and support, and then you get access to everyone on the platform to buy um, and connect with no commission. And you know, as we go forward in time, we have this ambition because we have this wonderful new word, the digital. So we weave the digital back into the physical. And I think we are unprecedented in that regard. Next. May, we're having our second um, digital show, Beth Greenacre and Joe Baring, who are superstar female curators in London, are exclusively picking women artists for a show here in the gallery. So that's created, you know, that's like a huge opportunity for women artists, trying to level the scales of women artists in the world. And not only that, they get on the app, they get all the tools, they get all that support, but they have a chance to be in a in real life show. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, so every user, curator, artist, and art lover get amazing tools, they get supported, and then this weave into the digital. So where we see we sit is sort of, well, I always say I want to be the Netflix of the art world, um, in that Netflix took over Hollywood and now are the biggest producers of TV and film in the world. And I feel like we could be very much the largest supporters of sales in the art world for the largest number of artists globally. And we have this capacity to have these unique search metrics. It's a destination only for art, but like Instagram, you have direct messaging, you have total connection with each other. We also have this, what's not on there should be Spotify, but we have this peer to peer um, kind of judging everybody's work and we can let the community put forward their favorite artist. Um, again, the dating app, obviously, and then Art Logic, which I really admire. Um, providing these great tools to back up every type of user. So a curator can build a show, art lovers build their collections, and artists have their portfolios and art on the app. Um, and then Etsy is there because it's a direct purchase, um, and, and, and we step back. But I don't want Etsy's latest problem, that they're changing all that um, late in the game. So that's the kind of where Fair Art Fair fits. Um, and again, it's this enormous market that's kind of underserved. Um, and I, I think all of us have heard that. I'm too poor and not smart enough to buy art. You go into a gallery and you feel intimidated. You feel, and, and again, through our experience here, we have so many people come in and they're like, so approachable. I can just ask any question and it's so easy. And, you know, we, we made a promise never to have that desk where someone's hiding behind it and spying on you. You know, we're really very relaxed and casual here and we're all working artists. 
but that wasn't enough anecdotal evidence. We really needed to support it with further. So we commissioned um, an amazing media company called Kite Factory. And we did two surveys, the US and UK. We'll probably move on further later, but we really established um, through a great survey of questions to art lovers who we really wanted to identify and artists about how they feel. And the numbers came back extraordinarily of this kind of intimidation, not feeling very secure, that galleries don't feel transparent. Um, and then really excitingly that once we described what Fair Art Fair would do for you as an art lover, how likely would you be to subscribe? And the numbers are off the charts, right? We So, we, so in the UK, 4.4 million people were happily wanting to subscribe. So we're going to go get all of them. <laughs> um, and 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 it's to me um, the, the most important thing that we'll do because artists really want to be seen and we can find artists and we know where to find them and we know where the grad shows are and we've got 11 years supporting artists. So we know how to get that audience and we've successfully done that on the app. The harder one is to find the buyers. Um, and so that's a, a next big project for us. Um, so it's really creating this community, this circular community that supports each other to thrive um, and, and really providing an enormous um, population of people who are underserved, that don't feel comfortable to buy art without some kind of guidance. And that's why we introduced the curators and selectors onto the app to give people guidance. Um, but in the spirit of fairness, I'm very proud of the fact that we have two arena to buy. So we have total discovery which means every artist that comes on the app is immediately visible and available because we can't predict what lover wants what art. I have aesthetics and I have curatorial vision, but there are, there are artists that meet the needs of an art lover that might be outside of my curatorial remit, um, but we will constantly bring in more and more. We are building um, this sort of selectors and we look forward to having like celebrity selectors and all kinds and Dennis, you will be invited to make a selection. <laughs> um, so that that kind of got, you have the choice of a guided kind of tour and that you can go through some of the curators and they can help you choose work on the app or you can fly solo and choose how you like and fall in love and have a new work of art and support an artist. Um, I'm very, very proud of the fact that we are MVP, which is also all these words I never used before, but, um, or whatever abbreviations. Um, so we are, we are, generating revenue we have over 500 subscribers on the app like correct myself we have 225 subscribers on the app and we also have a population that we brought from the gallery onto the app so that we had an instant population so we had sort of 500 on the app plus or minus um and then we have an eight percent conversion rate another thing i didn't know about before but i think we're four times the kind of average conversion rate, 2%, if I understand correctly, is really good. So that's exciting and our, we're only six months old, by the way. <laughs> um, we've had 35,000 impressions on the app stores and um, we've done that all with a very lean, um, very passionate team um, to try to prove what we really felt was happening here in the gallery. Mm. So that's kind of, I think we got everything there in a nutshell. Well, wow. that sounds very impressive in a such short period of time. I was really surprised when you said like all these amazing numbers and then just added like six months old because- <laughs> And that's where I sort of go, oh my God, it's only six months. <laughs> it's only six months. And I'm sure there are so many things ahead. I feel like you already discussed it and you already explained it, but how would you put in short, like your main mission in Fair at Fair? What would it be? Yeah, so the, the, the mission is to liberate artists and art lovers to find each other. It's, it's really as simple as that. The main mission is this missing chunk in the art world and, and really to allow artists to live by their practice and allow art lovers to live with real art. Because I think people, people think only collectors live with real art and I buy something at Ikea. And it, but we've just got to break the back of that. You know, there are just so many artists that are making amazing works that deserve to be in people's home and those artists deserve to live by their practice. And they should stop being blocked by that capacity by very exclusive art world metrics. Stacey, you know, uh, as an artist, you, you, of course, you know that the shortest uh, the, the shortest the artist statement is 
the more chances to sell the artwork are. Uh, the same with the startup. That, that's why we were very happy to, to hear that you have a short statement, uh, sorry, the, 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 short, the short mission <laughs> for a digital artist, uh, artist nowadays. It's called uh, Crypto Manifesto. But for, <laughs> but for yeah, we'll, we'll get back, we'll get back to, to digital art uh, a bit later. And now I'd, I'd like to, to mention that one of your previous competitors, I mean, the, the Saatchi art was sold to, I mean, last year it, it, it was sold to uh, Graham, Graham Holdings as part of Leaf Group uh, for $323 million, which means that uh, as soon as you uh, reach the expectations of your your investors and you've already proved your your concept and the the uh, conversion rate uh, shows that you you found the the right problem and you okay. found the right solving of that problem which is uh, more important that than uh, finding the the right problem because problem can can remain the problem unsolved so I wish you even better success than 323 million uh, as a result. <laughs> but yeah, but getting back to your audience, getting back to your audience whose expectations mm. you solve, whose problems you solve, um, could you please just uh, describe in short how can artists, collectors and curators, the three main groups, uh, benefit from fair art fair? Let's imagine you are pitching in front of them. So you're an artist, you come on the app, instantly what you get to do is upload unlimited upload of all your work. You can add all your inventory. That inventory can be divided into albums so you can control who the public sees. They can be public, not public, priced, not priced, everything you can possibly imagine. And one of my favorite things that was from day one, I wanted it because I suffer from it all the time. There's automatic documentation production. So you have someone interested in work, you're at a dinner party and you show a painting on your app and that person wants it, you can click one button, it automatically populates a PDF, the name of the work, all the details of the work from your studio, validated by Fair Out Fair. And in, I'd say 1.5 seconds, your text messaging or even airdropping it to the person sitting next to you. So PDFs, invoices, um, certificates of authenticity and uh, loan agreements are all auto-populated. Um, we have you can select as much inventory as you want and download it as a CSV. We'll be launching Excel and thumbnails for that as well soon. Your studio can be geolocated through your profile, so we have mapping. We're making a high-level conversation with people like Airbnb, so that you come into town and you can look at a map and find a studio. And another conversation with a one-way video system so that you're in your studio, you can mark that you're there, a person can just click on you and come and have a look at what's in your studio. So all these really exciting opportunities for you as an artist to be discovered and seen. Beyond that, sorry, that's for artists, but there's more. <laughs> there's a notice board. Um, we have direct messaging. You can be favorited. So you can kind of work together within the community. We have um, a three-pronged notice board, so you can put events, exhibitions, and um, mm -hmm. kind of advertising. So if you have an easel to sell, or you know, so there's a whole notice board metric that you can check and see what's going on. And we constantly um, update it with opportunities that we validate that we think will be great for artists. Um, so that's artists. Um, for collectors, the tools are similar but customized, right? So for a collector in total privacy, they can upload their entire collection, catalog it, keep track of it. Um, and we've started with that privacy, but we're getting feedback now that they want to be able to share it. So we're looking at VR environments so that you can put your collection into a museum space, see your collection outside of your home, invite other people to see the work you've collected because so much great work sits unseen in private collections. So we thought it'd be really great to quasi gamify the collector's arena. Um, and so that obviously they have entree to everyone on the app, they can collect and now we also get feedback that they may also want a secondary market on the app. So we, we, we're exploring because we keep getting this extraordinary ideas from our population. Um, and 
obviously the most wonderful advantage for the collectors is that they have a direct access to the artists, they support the artist directly, and they don't pay a commission. So I would say one piece purchased on the app zeroes your subscription payment in one go. And we are exploring different ways that the art lovers might have because we want more of them. So we may give them more advantageous subscription metrics when just exploring all that. And then curators is, is important because we developed all the tools so that we personally could curate shows on the app. So there's an exhibition metric that we can, from the app, make a digital exhibition. And again, we can translate that into VR environments. So we built all that out and then we were like, wait, there's gonna be a lot of curators that want this. So the same, they can upload, you can favorite, you can keep track of your favorites, you can make your um, selections public and make a proposal to us for you as a curator to have it on the app and also have it considered for digital um, re in real life exhibitions. And then again, when we bring, I think it's in Q3, when we bring in the VR, those shows can start to move into the VR environments. Um, and again, this kind of direct connection and this full circle. So all three thrive, like it, the whole thing is winning relationships. So every relationship wins, no one's exploited and everybody thrives is really the thread between all parties. And everyone has access to the notice board. Everyone has the direct messaging, the geolocation, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and there is an added one I want to put in there that I love is we all know the city centric gallery problem. And we also know the sustainability and the CO2 issues. So we're very excited about being able to um, collect the data and know where there's a group of artists assess them and say we're going to have a show local and we're going to bring the art levels local so that you really can start to have local initiatives and protect the environment by letting artists get together where they are instead of having to come to london or to new york or that really you can bring together art lovers and artists where they are a quick question is that your art behind you yes we know the answer. Yes. we know the answer but yes 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 it is knows. yeah so I'm a working artist and I know what it's like to try to bring your practice to the world and, and um, ex kind of expose yourself. So it's really this platform of opportunity. And I'm on the app. So if you get on the app, you can see my work. <laughs> it's very important. It's very important when a founder of the uh, app is also registered there. I mean, it I'm an artist, collector plus... and, 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 and um, curator on the app. So I got all three accounts. Have you, have you already made several purchases as a collector there? that i have bought one so far so far good yeah but i and i think that's that's a really good question too dennis because because we're non-transactional keeping track of sales so we want to find a way to gamify that so that when artists sell they have like a checkbox because we're not keeping track of it and it's one of the bit of data capture that i think we're gonna maybe queue whatever four or five we're gonna want to find a way to do that simply to know the success of the app. So you, you, you've started using the benefits of zero commission, I understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As you already mentioned, you did so many things within the last six months and there's so many opportunities just in front of you, I believe. And I was wondering, what's your vision for the Fair at Fair like for the next five years? What would you like to see in the future? One of the things I, probably the most excited about is opening zero commission galleries um, so that the public has that utter transparency and direct connection. And they know that when they buy the work, the artist is supported hundred um, percent. So if the app and the subscription model generates the revenue, we think it will, we'd love to see within that five years, two or three galleries that are zero commission. Um, we'd like to um, expand those VR kind of really all the exciting tools and yeah. benefits that we can support in the digital environment um, and those partnerships, I think, um, in those five years to really have some great partnerships with, you know, there's some, there's peculiar ones we're trying to approach, you know, whether that's Revolut and all their customers should just have the app as a benefit because um, Revolut's so great at creating benefits for their customers. Um, so these amazing partnerships that have populations of people that really want to live with real art and, and we start to do that. Um, I think that's a couple of good things. Yeah. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, I'd like to ask you the question. I mean, uh, as promised and 
as even more expected, we'd like to, to shift our conversation to digital art and NFTs. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your personal perspective on NFT and digital art market? I think in the early days, I was reading a lot of the press about the environmental impact. Um, and and I, so I tread lightly. Um, I've grown in, for a number of different reasons. I know that we'll be introducing it and we have a holding hub screen for NFTs already on the app. And also I have a very, um, a very interested sort of mentor investor who's a world expert in NFTs. Um, and I trust his guidance. And I know that we'll have that. But where I think I'm particularly excited about NFT tagging is the copyright um, that we evaporate copyright needs. Um, so again, in this kind of winning, thriving, what I'm interested in for all the artists is they're able to track that work of art for the rest of the life throughout the digital world and in the real world. And this is such a liberation and agency for the artists. We're seeing it in the music industry, you know, that, that, that Universal Studios and Sony are nervous because artists now can really do their own copyright for their music. So I think it's inevitable that we have this for the artist. Um, so I think, great. I personally want to make an NFT um, to support the ocean. I want to make a, because my practice, as you can see, it's very ocean. Uh, my, my passion is the sea and the ocean. So I, I will be making an NFT to raise funds um, in support of cleaning up the ocean. Um, so it's, it's definitely in the business plan. Sounds great. And what do you think, how exactly NFTs can actually change the art market? I mean, there are different perspectives on it, but we're very curious in yours. I'm no expert, but in watching it, um, what I think is the NFT world is going to settle down just like the art world has, and it's going to sector. So they'll, you'll, they'll have baseball cards and you'll have this. Right now, I think it's it's totally Vegas to me. It's completely Las Vegas. And you had so many crypto billionaires that couldn't spend their money anywhere. And suddenly they needed to. And so be it. That if, if, it's, if it's filtering into art's pockets, I completely love it. Um, but I, I think it's going to, you know, it's in its nascent. It's a gold rush, isn't it? It's really like the San Francisco gold rush. And everybody turned up. And then you realize in time that it settles down and, you know, it becomes something else altogether. Um, so it's thrilling and confusing. Um, so I try to navigate it in terms of its usefulness and direct kind of benefit that it could create exactly for our community. But I do think that, you know, it's an inevitable part of our, our, our world now. Uh, Stacy, let's uh, return back from the digital art world to the physical art world as soon as fair art fair at least for now represents the the classic art market which needs support attention and uh and money so in your opinion what kind of initiatives will make today's art market a better place we're talking about tech uh, we're talking about both let's say physical initiatives and tech initiatives um i think you, 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 the sort of Vegas that we've been talking about, I think what's really upsetting is the artist is usually absent in the conversation. Money is talked about. The artwork is seldom talked about. And generally, the artist is not even in the conversation. So what I'd really love to see is the, the heroic nature of the people that really sacrifice and take a lot of risk to make artwork. Because I, I think all artists, and that really is musicians through, chef, through to chefs, um, are really the people who are crucially making life on Earth nicer to inhabit. Um, so I'd love to see the art world kind of let the artists be the most important thing. Um, and that's why when you go on the app, you can look at artists and you see the artists first. We've slowed down the process intentionally. You don't tile through work after work side by side and it's not like a shopping mall. It's really about the people and we've slowed it down and you get to know them. Um, so this is, uh, and, and again, it's exactly what's happened in our bricks and mortar that people get to know the artist and you can't help but want to support them and live with their work. And I know if you have any artwork, if you bought it from the artist, you think of them when you look at it. But if you've not met the artist, you look at an expensive object. Uh, so I think I'd love to see the artist really, really brought to the fore. That would be my utopian dream. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sounds great. And with fair fair doing so great and in such a short period of time, what would be your like top three advice like you can give to the young founders who are like doing their startups in arts? Um, it never gets easier, I would say. It you know, it is the hardest um work I've ever done. And you know, I'm I'm not young anymore. Um so the perseverance and resilience it takes, um, it's always more expensive than you'll think it'll be. Um, but I think if you do have a problem that you recognize and a great solution, um, attract really helpful people. And, and the number of people that have kind of turned up, given their time, you know, the curators to date have just completely given their time. There's so many people that want to see this become successful. I think the hardest part is fundraising, you know, that, and that's where we're at. And I, I am great at ideas. I had no idea the depth and distance of things I had to learn, adapt, figure out. And it's every day something new happens and I'm like, oh my God, I have to do that too. So it's hard. I think that's the hardest part is you've got to wear 4,000 hats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. I mean, we've just had a beautiful example of how to represent uh, during, let's say, 40 minutes, how to represent yourself in one as an artist, as a personality, as a startup founder and <laughs> as a beautiful woman. So oh, you're too one. kind. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Um, and it's also you know, it's really only the second time I really speak about this and there's so much in me and the conversation could probably go on for two more hours. But it's um, it's really exciting because I really feel we're on the edge of this kind of tipping point um, and a number of things happening. But we are, um, we have our finished pitch deck and we are going out to attract investment in order to grow. We've got two things we want to do, and that's a marketing and media plan and robust technology, the two obvious ones. And um, to scale this, um, I think will be exciting. Well, we wish you uh, great success with, with your uh, Fear Art Fear startup Thank and you. wish it to be successfully, you know, developed uh, till the exit or acquisition or merging with some art strategist. So whatever is in your head regarding your business plan in five or uh, 10 years, uh, for those who have just a bare idea, we'd like to remind that we, uh, we provide the uh, online pre-acceleration courses and the final date of the start of their start uh, has shifted to, but uh, shifted, but uh, let's say now it's static. It will be uh, 16th of uh, May. It has sh shifted due to the war in Ukraine, unfortunately. But now we are uh, online. We are all working and continue continuing contributing to this uh, project. More than 30 uh, extraordinary mentors are waiting for the students for uh, two classes classic art tech startup also which stacy represents i mean that part of the world which stacy represents and digital and nft startups so admissions are still open and we're starting on may 16th i also would like to remind that for ukrainian founders this these classes are for free and uh, which means that all the international startups who would like to have these classes for free for free should invite Ukrainian founders or co-founders or <laughs> CTO, chief technical officer. So uh, please do. They are worth inviting. They are the best and uh, you will never regret inviting Ukrainian co-founders. Uh, for instance, the co-founder of Fuel Arts, Roxana Zarnagar never regrets that she invited me as a co-founder of Fuel Arts. I'm also Ukrainian. Uh, so... Uh, I think you should make a database of people available like that, Dennis. That's a great idea, Stacey. Because I'm looking. <laughs> sure. Honestly. Sure. Th th thank you. Thank you. We'll... we'll uh, 
will consider and will take it into, into consideration. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> thank you again, Stacy. Thank you. Real uh, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so audience. much. Thank you, Sonia, for uh, co hosting that. Wish you success with uh, Fair Art Fair, and we wish success to your, uh, I mean, wish the success to the startup, and we're happy for your. Uh, customers, which will have zero commission and a lot of uh, fantastic uh, experience using your app. Thank you so much. It's really been fun, and it's just an opportunity to kind of practice how I share this. It's great. Thank you. Honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you.